of the pancreas and peripancreatic tissues and also limit my talk to solid lesions of the pancreas by, because I understand that Dr. Desh Pandey is going to be covering the uh, cytopathology of cystic lesions of the pancreas. So uh, let me go ahead and, okay. So the objective of my presentation today is to give you a very brief overview of US. Uh, I'm sure most people in the audience are familiar with e US and uh, the cytology of the pancreas and other potential contaminants uh, during the time of US FNA. And the bulk of my talk will be on illustrating examples of uh, solid pancreatic tumors and some peripancreatic lesions that one can encounter at the time of US FNA. And then at the end, I will speak briefly on the evolution and future directions uh, in US FNA. Uh, what we are doing right now and what is predicted in the future. So ES FNA, as you all know, is the diagnostic test of choice for pancreatic lesions. And uh, this is the most common specimen that we receive in our lab. Uh, and this is in brief what US does. And uh, basically an alt uh, flexible endoscope is introduced through the mouth into the stomach. And through the stomach, you can basically uh, sample lesions in the tail of the pancreas, you can sample lesions in the wall of the stomach, you can um, progress the endoscope, and then through the duodenum, you can uh, sample tissue uh, lesions in the head of the pancreas. Also, you, you can sample lesions of the liver, gallbladder, lesions in the wall of the duodenum, and also lymph nodes, both celiac lymph nodes, peripancreatic and periduodenal lymph nodes. Now, ES FNA for pancreas has a pretty high sensitivity, which is reported to be as high as almost 90%. And the specificity is also extremely high in the diagnosis of solid pancreatic lesions. So this is a really a very powerful tool that we have for our diagnosis of pancreatic lesions. Now, the additional rapid on-site evaluation or ROSE at the time of US FNA has been reported to increase the sensitivity and specificity of US FNA by 15 to 20%. And in our practice, we have uh, the luxury of having cytotechs so who are pretty well trained, who go into the endoscopic suite and perform rapid on-site evaluation and help triage the material that we receive at the time of the procedure. Uh, in addition to that, many of our uh, endoscopists and GI, uh, GI um, gastroenterologists perform uh, fine needle biopsies on these lesions along with FNA. Uh, fine needle biopsies of pancreas now uh, is a routine uh, practice. Um, it has been deemed to be very safe and is also supposed to be sensitive and specific uh, with a sensitivity and specificity reaching that of US FNA combined with rapid on-site evaluation. So the cytologic preparations that we make from these US FNA samples include direct smears with PAP and diff quick staining. We routinely perform cell blocks uh, and many of these mini cores that we get at the time of an endoscopic uh, biopsy is actually also processed as a cell block. And very rarely, we also sometimes do thin preps. So before I go into the pathology of pancreatic lesions, let's kind of familiarize ourselves with the normal cytology of the pancreas. I'm sure all of you are familiar, but just a brief recap. And this is how asana tissue looks like. Uh, it has been described as a grapes on a wine because of the lobular architecture. The acinar cells are kind of polyhedral in shape. They have moderate to abundant amount of granular cytoplasm, which may sometimes appear finely evacuated. The nuclei are usually eccentric, monotonous, bland looking with small nuclei. Ductal cells like glandular benign cells elsewhere in the body have a honeycombed architecture with the nuclei respecting each other without significant overlap and very monotonous appearance. Of course, sometimes you can get significant reactive ATP in these cells uh, in situations where the patient has undergone stenting 
or if there is history of radiation, etc. And in which case, uh, um, you know, it might be very difficult to differentiate these from adenocarcinomas. Of course, let's never forget the hitchhikers or the contaminants that you can see at the time of an FNA. This here is a duodenal mucosa, again, honeycomb pattern but it has this fried egg appearance of the goblet cells in between. And sometimes you can find these small lymphocytes uh, interspersed, uh, you know, this gives like, uh, has the sesame seed like appearance. Um, the gastric epithelium is mucinous and, uh, you know, the mucin is usually apical in location, does not reach the nucleus, uh, you know, this is, a feature which may not be very readily apparent, but really helps in identifying gastric uh, contaminant. Mesothelial cells can be rarely seen in US FNA di directed aspirates, uh, more commonly with uh, aspirates uh, using transabdominal approach. Now, as with pathology, to arrive at a diagnosis, you have to synthesize the clinical findings, the imaging findings, that is the findings on EUS, and then look at the cytology and come up with a diagnosis. Now, having said that, you will see with my presentation that, you know, many of these solid lesions in the pancreas can have overlapping cytology and EUS findings, and therefore, having a cell block and performing immunohistochemistry can be critical in the diagnosis of these tumors. Now, most of the solid pancreatic masses in the pan uh, are ductal adenocarcinomas. They are uh, overwhelmingly represented. 90% of the lesions will be ductal adenocarcinomas. Other tumors are rare. Uh, chronic pancreatitis comes in the differential diagnosis of solid pancreatic mass and, uh, you know, can really, on imaging, uh, overlap with the findings of a uh, malignancy. So let's go on with the first case. This is an elderly individual with a tumor in the head of the pancreas and on EUS, the mass is hypoechoic with irregular margins. As soon as the gastroenterologist looks at this image, he's thinking of malignancy. And um, you look at the aspirate, it's very cellular. You have large fragments like this, single cells in the background. The single cells, as you can see here, highly atypical with high NC ratio, irregular nuclear membranes. And within the uh, fragment, you can see there's marked an isonucleosis with cells uh, having nuclei four times that of their surrounding neighbors. There is also in this uh, field presence of necrosis. You can find mucin within these cells. And this is what we characteristically describe as the drunken honeycomb pattern, where the cells no longer respect each other's broader uh, borders. Sorry, and they overlap. It really looks as though these bees have had a little too much of meads, and they are really drunk, falling over each other. So this is a classic example of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And so if you see something like this, really it's not a problem to come or to arrive at the correct diagnosis. However, things are not always cut and dry. In this particular instance, everything matched, right? The clinical findings were very characteristic in the little individual with the mass in the head of the pancreas. The imaging was characteristic and the cytology was characteristic. So the diagnosis was not at all difficult. But as I mentioned, everything is not always cut and dried. And sometimes you can really come across problem situations the biggest uh, uh, hurdle, I think, in the diagnosis is well-differentiated adenocarcinoma, where the atypia is minimal. And then you basically look at the architectural atypia, where there is the loss of the typical honeycomb pattern. And sometimes uh, you, you can see the presence of two, um, multiple mitotic figures, which is something that you should not see with... Uh, reactive proliferation so this can be helpful and of course one feature which is really helpful is the cellularity so if you have a very hypercellular smear with minimal cytologic atypia it's unlikely to be a reactive process and is most likely to represent a malignant adenocarcinoma so sometimes the aspirates can be very postcellular as is in this case uh, and even you see in the cell block there are just a few 
um, atypical fragments that you can see. In these instances, we do resort to doing some stains, including S100P and M3, where you can see there is diffuse nuclear and cytoplasmic staining of the malignant cells with S100P and cytoplasmic staining with M3. And this can help in the diagnosis of adenocarcinomas. Now, here are a list of stains that can be used in making the differential uh, in identifying adenocarcinoma. So, in addition to S100P and M3, you can people use maspin, mesothelin, claudin, or the loss of expression of SMAT4, PVHL, CD10, P53, or even the overexpression of P53. Now, most of the times you can't rely on just one stain. You have to use a panel of immunohistochemistry and um, you know, various sensitivities and specificities have been um, uh, designated to these different panels. As you can see here, we do not use SMAT4. We don't have SMAT4. We also do not use this um, panel. We usually resort to S100P and M3. And, in our experience, it has uh, been kind of practical uh, in the deployment of this panel for distinguishing adenocarcinomas from reactive proliferation. So let's now move on to the second case. Again, has a very typical clinical presentation. It's a middle-aged lady with a mass in the body and tail of the pancreas. And now you will see a kind of a similar um, U.S. image. This is going to be the theme in the remaining presentation of cases from the solid lesions of the pancreas, and that is the mass is well defined with the hypoechoic and anechoic areas. The anechoic areas basically suggestive of cystic component within the tumor. Now, this aspirate, as you can see, is highly cellular. There are cells in the background, which are single cells. I'm sorry. Uh, and then you have these cells which are uh, attached to these fibrovascular cores, as you can see here. Um, and this is better highlighted with the presence of this mixoid material around the cores. Um, and you can also see some cells which look a little more pleomorphic. Uh, on higher power, these uh, cells have uh, nuclei which are oval in shape. The chromatin is pretty finely granular. Uh, you can see the presence of nuclear grooves here and there. And then again, you can see the presence of these uh, pleomorphic looking cells, some of which are multinucleated. Uh, here is the diff-quick preparation showing the presence of these um, metachromatic spherules in the background and we had a very good cell block here and you can see it kind of recapitulates what we saw in the uh, FNA smears and also the cells are showing this kind of um, globules, hyaluronized globules within the cytoplasm. So by just looking at the aspiration smear pictures, the cell block and the typical clinical findings you know we are thinking obviously of a solid pseudopapillary neoplasm in this instance and so we did a uh, array of stains the barricade catenin stain as you can see here showed diffuse nuclear and cytoplasmic immunoreactivity the progesterone receptor was positive in this particular case synaptophysin just showed a rare scattered cell that was positive so this is a case of a solid pseudopapillary uh, neoplasm of the pancreas. The only finding that was a little odd was the presence of these pleomorphic and atypical uh, multinucleated giant cells. Um, no mitotic figures were identified in the aspirate and the proliferation index was very low. So this is the resection specimen. Again, characteristic morphological appearance of a solid pseudopapillary neoplasm but you know about 20 percent of this tumor showed the presence of these pleomorphic cells there was no mitosis there was no necrosis in this tumor so this uh, pleomorphism in solid pseudopapillary neoplasm of the pancreas has been re uh, reported this is a large study of about 139 uh, resection specimens of uh, spn in which they found 18 cases in which there were more than 20% of the tumor cells showing pleomorphism. And they tried to see if there was any statistical, statistical significance of pleomorphism uh, with response to behavior 
uh, with of these uh, tumors and they found that really did not have any uh, uh, prognostic significance and so uh, it, it is just an oddity something that you can find but it doesn't really change the uh, behavior of these tumors um, or in the cytology literature, I came across this case report, which highlights the presence of these atypical cells in the FNA smears of SPN. Uh, and uh, they also highlighted uh, the importance of differentiating these tumors with neuroendocrine tumors, which can show pleomorphic cells more commonly than SPN. And also sometimes, you know, if you have a lot of these atypical atypical cells aspirated then you might sometimes confuse them from undifferentiated um, carcinomas of the pancreas so that's another differential to keep in mind uh, in such instances okay so now uh, just to kind of summarize spn is a low-grade malignant tumor with excellent long-term prognosis uh, the cancer disease free survival for these patients is more than 96 percent after 10 years uh, and there are no real good pathologic or clinical parameters that can predict poor clinical outcome in these patients. Uh, one thing that has been noted to be associated with poorer outcome is the presence of undifferentiated or sarcomatoid components within these tumors, which have been associated with death following metastasis. So now let's move on to another case. This is uh, again an elderly male. 1.2 centimeter mass in the uncinate process. Again, same kind of finding, hypoechoic, well circumscribed mass. Sometimes these masses can also show cystic change, so it can have hypoechoic and anechoic areas. And the aspirate was extremely cellular, as you can see here. There are these aggregates, clusters singly dispersed cells you can see these kind of acinar or you can say kind of pseudo rosets that you can see here the tumor cells were very monotonous they had this plasma cytoid kind of morphology at places if you look at the nuclei they have fine chromatin or well i will argue that it has a salt and pepper kind of chromatin at least at places and the diff quick uh, stain here you know just to kind of show the plasma cytoid morphology of the tumor cells. Now, this is the cell block. Um, we performed a battery of stains, and this tumor was diffusely positive for synaptophysin and chromogranin. And no surprise here, this indeed was a is a neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas. And we did a KI7 in this particular case, MIG1, and the proliferation index was less than 1%. So this is how we uh, reported the tu uh, tumor. We call it a well-differentiated pa pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, possibly grade one. We always put in a comment saying that the final grading should be done in the resection specimen. This uh, tumor was resected and had a grade one tumor on the resection specimen too. Now, Imano, Histochemistry in neuroendocrine tumors is important uh, to differentiate it from its mimics. And uh, one of the tumors that can really mimic uh, um, a net or neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas is the solid pseudopapillary neoplasms, which can also show positivity with uh, certain neuroendocrine markers, including cyanotophysin in some cases. But there are certain, uh, of course, beta-catenin is important important because the neuroendocrine tumors is if present it is non-nuclear whereas in solid pseudopapillary neoplasm you will see nuclear staining other newer stains that have uh, come uh, in the past few years is lef1 tfe3 and sox11 and that can be pretty helpful in differentiating spns from neuroendocrine tumors which are negative for these markers now, a few words on grading. Of course, you're all familiar with grading of pancreatic tumor, neuroendocrine tumors, and it depends upon the mitotic rate, which is counted in resection specimens on uh, 50 high power fields, and the uh, proliferation, KI67 proliferation index, for which at least you need to count 500 cells. Now, so the question is, 
Is there any great concordance between FNA specimens and resection specimens using KI-67? And this is a study uh, which has been recently published in AJCP uh, where they looked at 49 tumors and they graded them both on the FNA specimens on cell block and on the resection specimen. And they also tried to look at different methods of grading, including things like eyeballing, looking at hot spots and counting the entire cells in the cell block. What they found was that all their grade one tumors were correctly graded. That means on the resection also they were grade one tumors, but they had problems with their grade two tumors, which were significantly undergraded on cytology when there was less than thousand cells present on the cell block. However, when more than thousand cells were present, the grading was more concordant. And they found that in this instance, they could kind of grade the cells similar to what uh, you can do in the resection specimen using hot spot counting, and it showed better correlation with surgical specimens. There have also been multiple other uh, published studies on grading peanuts, uh, sorry, um, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And most of these studies have shown that, you know, uh, what happens is tumor upgrading in the resection specimen, downgrading never really has been documented. So if you have grade three tumors diagnosed on FNA, they're not going to get downgraded to a grade one or grade two tumors on resection specimen. Having said that, you know, what is the clinical significance of grading on cytology? We really don't know because most of these studies are retrospective. So we don't know what the clinical consequence of giving a grade on FNA cytology specimens. And there is also the problem of not uh, really uh, having a well-established optimal method for quantification of KI-67 expression on cyto cytology smears. So uh, we can make the diagnosis, we can give a presumptive grade, but you know that is really not going to determine management of these patients. Okay, so let's move on to the next case again. Elderly gentleman with a six centimeter mass in the pancreatic head. This was a lesion which again, was well circumscribed, had areas which were more hypoechoic, areas which were anechoic, suggestive of cystic component. I do not have the images. This is an older case. What we have on FNA is a very cellular smear with these large fragments. Some of them are club shaped. Uh, there is this granular material in the background. And of course, there's also blood contaminating the background with fibrin. Uh, this is the diff quick preparations showing these large fragments, some with fibrovascular cores. Also, you can see many bare nuclei in the background. There is this kind of granular debris in the background that you can see also in the diff quick smear. And these are the, um, this is the morphology of the cells on high part. You can see that they are kind of polygonal in appearance with abundant abundant cytoplasm, well-defined cytoplasmic membranes, granular to finely vacillated cytoplasm, which is better illustrated on this diff quick state. Uh, higher power view showing kind of this asana configuration with round nuclei, prominent nuclei, uh, single mitotic or apoptotic figure here. And so on the basis of this morphology, we did not have cell block in this particular case. Uh, and the diagnosis of an asinic cell carcinoma of the pancreas was suggested, and this is the resection specimen. And indeed, this is an asinic uh, carcinoma of the asinic cell carcinoma of the pancreas. Um, the pass with diastase stain will show the presence of the zymogen granules, which are resistant to diastase digestion. Uh, trypsin stain is positive, uh, and that is really helpful in the diagnosis of an asthmic cell carcinoma of the pancreas. Now, these tumors are extremely rare. They form less than 2% of all uh, tumors of the pancreas. You know, they have this very classic clinical presentation Prognosis of this tumor is somewhere between that of ductal adenocarcinoma and neuroendocrine tumors. And sometimes the diagnosis of these tumors can be difficult. And uh, it really helps if you have a good cell block to do immunohistochemistry to differentiate it from its uh, diff uh, mimics. 
Now let's move on to another case, uh, which kind of eerily resembles the case that I just presented to you. This patient is again elderly, but it has a mass in the body of the pancreas. Again, cellular large fragments with uh, you know transgressing vessels, as you can see here. Higher part, the tumor cells have well-defined cytoplasmic membranes has a granular to kind of vacillated cytoplasm, round nuclei. And on diff quake, you know, you can see the clearing of the cytoplasm, the transgressing blood vessels, uh, and this metachromatic uh, material around the vessels. And so the question is, what is this tumor? Is this an arsenic cell carcinoma? Because it really resembles the case that I just presented to you. Or is this an abducted adenocarcinomas? Because you can get a clear cell carcinoma of the pancreas, which is actually a variant of ductal adenocarcinoma. Uh, and so we had a cell block. And here in the cell block, it doesn't really look like an arsenic cell carcinoma. Instead of forming asni, you have these nests, which are separated by these sinusoidal capillaries that you can see here. And uh, so another diagnosis comes to mind and so you know you want to think of metastasis so is this a metastatic clear cell tumor and what is the common tumor which has clear cell carcinoma which can metastasize everywhere anywhere in the body and that is a renal cell carcinoma so we did paxate staining which was diffusely positive and ca9 which was also positive within the cells so this was a case of a metastatic clear cell renal cell carcinoma Metastas metastasis to pancreas is really unusual but can happen and of all the tumors that are mes uh, metastatic to the pancreas are actually rcc is the most common renal cell carcinoma is the most common forming 50 percent of uh, carcinomas that metastasize to the pancreas now the problem with these tumors is that they can present at a late stage so it might be difficult to elicit the history of uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma which was resected maybe 10 years before and they can also present as solitary metastasis and therefore they can really mimic a primary tumor of the pancreas so there are other tumors that can also metastasize to the pancreas including tumors from the lung breast etc this here is a typical example of a tumor from the lung. I mean, no rewards for anybody who guesses this correct because this is a very typical example of a small cell carcinoma, highly cellular spheres. You can see the crush artifact, the typical salt and pepper chromatin pattern, the presence of molding. And so this is a case of a small cell carcinoma. You know, this is a cell block here. The tumor cells are diffusely immunoreactive for synaptophysin and also diffusely positive for TTF1. TTF1 positivity can be rarely seen in pancreatic small cell carcinomas, but not commonly um, demonstrated. So that might be helpful. Now, whenever you see a small cell carcinoma in the pancreas, you know you have to think of metastasis from the lung. Uh, you can also, as I mentioned, get small cell carcinoma of the pancreas, which is a high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma of the pancreas. But uh, always, you know, do imaging, rule out a lung primary, because if you have an isolated small cell carcinoma of the pancreas, then the first modality or primary modality of therapy in these uh, cases is surgical excision. Um, and uh, if this is actually a lung cancer, which is metastasis to pancreas, then you will be giving systemic therapy with chemo, uh, chemo. Okay, now we are going to shift gear and I hope I'm good with my time. Uh, please let me know if I'm still lagging behind. I have a few more uh, slides to present. So this is an 80 year old male who had a two centimeter mass in the submucosal region of the stomach. So you can see here very well defined subepithelial hypoechoic lesion in the stomach. And FNA was performed highly cellular spindle cells that are in large fragments with a kind of uh, fibrous stroma in between. 
and some of these areas showed more epithelioid cells and in between you could see some cells like this which were a little bit more pleomorphic um, but most of the areas had uh, either a spindle morphology with these oval to uh, spindle cells with blunt nuclei or nuclei with blunt ends sorry uh, on diff quick you can see the presence of the uh, stroma which stain uh, had a metachromatic kind of an appearance and of course the presence of these pleomorphic cells now this was a tumor with spindle to epithelial morphology arising in the wall of the stomach with the presence of few pleomorphic cells and there were no mitotic figures identifiable either on the FNA or on the cell block and this indeed was a gastrointestinal stromal tumor because that is what you're thinking of right with this clinical presentation and this tumor was diffusely positive for CD117 and was also diffusely positive for DOG1. So you can see pleomorphic cells in GIS <clears throat> and what is the significance really not much this is a paper which is still in print uh, from um, Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, by Jason Harnick and they found that in about 2500 uh, tumors that they looked uh, for the presence of pleomorphic cells they found only two percent of their cases to have just uh, uh, to have pleomorphic cells in untreated GIS so you can get pleomorphic cells in treated GIS but again not a high number maybe about uh, another additional two percent so uh, not a very common finding they also found in their study that presence of pleomorphic cells in GIS were more commonly seen in high risk, high risk GIS but it was not kind of limited to high risk GIS they could also see pleomorphic cells in lower like uh, gastrointestinal stromal tumors. Most importantly, they found that these uh, pleomorphic cells really have no prognostic significance for stratifying uh, gastrointestinal tumors. Um, this is a case of a more conventional GIST spindle tumor uh, with you know singly dispersed cells with um, blunt ended nuclei, large fragments here. And you know, as I mentioned, when the gastroenterologist is looking at a lesion like this in the wall of the stomach, they definitely do a biopsy. And we get these microcores which get processed as cell blocks and you know, diffusely positive for CD117 and DOG1. And we also then send out these specimens for mutational analysis. This was a tumor which showed KIT exon 11 mutation and responded pretty well to sonatinib. Of course, uh, the prognostication of GIST depends upon the location, whether it's in the stomach or in the intestine. It depends on the size of the tumor and the mitotic count, uh, which is done in, um, in an area of five millimeters square, which would correspond to 20 to 25 high power fields. And uh, so you can just imagine how difficult it might be to do this on um, cell block preparation because you may not have that much of material. Of course, uh, mutational status can uh, is also important to predict uh, the response of these tumors to therapy. So, do we need to do mitotic counts, and how uh, important, how uh, prognostically significant is mitotic count in grading these tumors on aspiration material? Um, most of the studies have shown that there is an underestimate on uh, cell block preparations from FNAs and therefore it is not real uh, reliable method of proliferation assessment in gist of the stomach and uh, small intestine okay so let's go on to this next case please let me know if I am doing good for time uh, otherwise I'll go to these slides a little faster okay so you so still have time please continue okay. Okay, great, because I don't want to really kind of run through my slides and at the same time, I don't want to kind of really have you guys uh, spend the rest of your night listening to my talk. So here is a 34-year-old male with a 3.5 centimeter mass in the head of the pancreas. Again, cellular tumor, spindle cell tumor with cohesive fragments. 
and you can see these fascicles maybe the presence of some small internuclear cytoplasmic inclusions here and there the stroma may look a little fibrillar in these areas some of these nuclei are a little buckled uh, more fibrillar stroma and this is the cell block and presence of internuclear cytoplasmic inclusion some buckling or comma shaped nuclei more fibrillar stroma s100 stain was diffusely positive and this was a schwannoma of the pancreas so rare things can happen when you're evaluating solid lesions of the pancreas um, I think there are about 70 odd cases of uh, primary pancreatic schwannoma reported in literature in, and we are talking about surgical pathology literature and in I think on cytology there are about 20 cases so they are not difficult to diagnose if you are thinking about this lesion and if you have cell block to do stains right that can really help differentiate uh, pancreatic schwannoma from other uh, tumors that can have a spindle cell morphology including pancreatic gifs which are rare but still occur so important to do immunohistochemical stains this i think folks would be my last case 78 year old female with a submucosal lesion in their duodenum and this is the endoscopic image and you can see there is this mass uh, which is periampillary in location the mucosa was intact on top of it it had a kind of polypoid appearance with uh, projection to the lumen of the duodenum and on eus again it was a hypoechoic well circumscribed mass uh, which was submucosal in location now us guided fna and biopsy was performed and as i mentioned to you you know our cytotechs go to the uh, ultrasound uh, to the eus um, or endoscopic suite and on fna they could not find uh, enough cells and so they call it inadequate on rows and so the um, gastroenterologist did a biopsy and our cytotechnologist did a very enthusiastic touch prep on this specimen and you can see it is pretty cellular on touch there were these cells which had a more kind of uh, epithelial appearance a lot of these cells were forming aggregates but did not really have too much of cytoplasm and in the background you know there were these uh, bare nuclei maybe some spindle looking cells but you know very difficult to categorize these cells in addition to that there were these cells which had abundant amount of cytoplasm a centric kind of nuclei with the nucleolus and the cell you know the cytotech said oh wow this is um, you know adequate the cell so the biopsy is fine but unfortunately the biopsy was not very cellular okay we had only very few actually just these two nests of epithelial looking cells very banal monomorphic nuclei and then we had this spindle component which did not look like smooth mother cell cells actually they have a very schwannian or neural kind of uh, appearance with buckled nuclei fibrillar stroma and so one of my very smart cytology colleagues looked at this material and said hmm you know there is neural tissue let's try and do stains uh, well unfortunately the only thing that we had in the subsequent sections of the cell block was the spindle component which was positive for s100 and in addition to that you know there were these epithelioid cells and um, then that person really thought of this lesion and decided that this could be a gangliocytic paraganglioma on the basis of the location the endoscopic findings and the presence of this neural tissue and epithelioid cells and kudos to that person it indeed was is a gangliocytic paraganglioma here you have the uh, duodenal mucosa there is this well circumscribed lesion in the submucosa of the duodenum having these uh, epithelioid kind of cells forming trabeculae and nests and in addition to that you can see a spindle shown in component and then you have these large cells which are ganglion like cells and on staining you know the spindle component is positive for s100 and the epithelial and shown in uh, uh sorry ganglion like cells positive synaptophysin and for 
progesterone receptor. So if you look back on the touch prep, you know, these are possibly the epithelial cells and definitely there were these ganglion cells that could be seen. Um, but this is a case where, you know, sometimes it happens where you do very uh, vigorous touch preps, you know, there's not enough um, cells in the actual biopsy specimen. Right, so this is the neural component and this is the epithelial component of the paragang of the ganglocytic paraganglioma. Now these ganglocytic paragangliomas are extremely rare tumors, right? But you have to think of this when you're looking at a submucosal lesion in the duodenum, especially periampullary in location. These tumors, even if they undergo metastasis, have a pretty good prognosis. And on histology, they have these three components, as I've already illustrated to you. And if you do uh, stains, you know, the epithelial component can uh, look like a neuroendocrine tumor component, and they will also stain with chromogranin and synaptophysin. Uh, but the important thing is they're positive for progesterone receptors, and that can really help distinguish these uh, ganglocytic paraganglioma from well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. And the reason is that, you know, although there are these three components that you see in these tumors, you know, you can have one component more predominant than the other. And so if you don't see the spinal component or the ganglion cells, they can really mimic a neuroendocrine tumor of the duodenum. And this is here a study published in 2019 where they highlighted the importance of doing immunohistochemistry for progesterone receptor and pancreatic polypeptide which is negative in uh, gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumors. Okay, now I'm winding down and coming to the <clears throat> end of my presentation. So, you know, US has been around for more than 25 years and con there has been a lot of progress that has been made in the technology with US. Uh, now we use contrast enhanced US and that has really helped in delineating these lesions uh, in the GI tract, including the pancreas. Another thing that is being investigated is the role of elastography, which kind of looks, um, you know, kind of uh, determines the firmness of the lesions. And, you know, when there is a malignancy, you're looking for firm areas um, and that can be done real time uh, along with the US and can really help in targeting the lesions better. In addition to just the technical advances in the imaging, there have also been a lot of advances in the needles that are available now for sampling the lesions. We have the standard uh, 22 and uh, 25 gauge needles for the FNA, but we also now have better needles for biopsies, including these pro core, sharp core, and fancy needles, which have cutting edges and have better tissue acquisitions uh, and better mini cores that can be retrieved from these uh, biopsies. In addition to that, there are certain other um, technologies, including mini forceps, which can be introduced through the 19 gauge FNA needles. Again, helps in tissue better tissue acquisition and something which is very interesting is needle based confocal laser endomicroscopy where you can actually introduce a laser confocal endomicroscope through the needle and you know in real time you can really see these lesions better of course this is really in its infancy and this might be something to look forward to in the near future now, with respect to the material that we get at US, we are doing already doing a lot with uh, less, right? We are uh, able to produce good cell blocks, do immunohistochemical stains to distinguish the various different types of uh, solid lesions. We can do flow cytometry if we are suspecting a hematopoietic tumor. So, you know, at the time of rapid on-site evaluation, we can triage the tissue and then we can use this tissue for molecular testing. Uh, FISH uh, is employed to distinguish benign from malignant um, conditions, uh, of the, sorry, malignant tumors that is adenocarcinomas. And, you know, nowadays they are really streamlining the FISH to tailor it more specifically for pancreatic tumors to distinguish pancreatic adenocarcinoma versus uh, indeterminate um, aspirates uh, because of uh, reactive 
uh, you know, instances with respect to stenting, etc. Uh, we are also using it for molecular tests, including NGS and targeted sequencing for diagnose, diagnostic purposes. You know, again, you can use, for example, KRAS mutations to differentiate benign lesions from malignant or adenocarcinomas. They are also used for uh, determining prognosis, right? For the purposes of tailoring therapy, for instance, I just mentioned about get mutational, uh, sorry, mutational analysis for gist because you know it really helps to know what the mutational status of the gist is. Uh, because if you have uh, exon mutations, uh, which are exon eleven mutations, they're going to respond very well to sunitinib. On the other hand, if you have a secret mutation in exon 9, uh, you might have to give a higher dose. And then PDGFRA with exon 18 is not going to respond. They're pretty resistant to therapy. Another thing that is in the pipeline is microRNA profiling, uh, again, in its infancy, but can really uh, help, um, you know, better triage uh, these samples and um, differentiate indeterminate cytologies from adenocarcinoma. So that uh, might be something that is happening in the near future. And of course, uh, you know, no talk is complete without mentioning the magic word AI, that is artificial intelligence. And I don't want to be flippant because it really it can be a very powerful diagnostic tool uh, for um, pathology and cytopathology. Uh, and of course, imaging, you know, AI based algorithms can be used for better classification of subepithelial lesions on US images. And there is this paper that has been published recently in gastric cancer. And in addition to that, you know, we can use AI for things like KI system proliferation index in neuroendocrine tumors. And if anybody is interested, this is a very interesting article on augmented reality microscopy for uh, NETs and KI6 proliferation. And this is uh, published by Pantanovic. So I think this is a very interesting read. And this is the future of pathology. So I think it's uh, good to really kind of um, get ourselves uh, much better um, informed about all these tools that are available and embrace it okay i think that was my last slide thank you very much for your 